Good morning. Thanks for uh, braving the weather coming over here and coming in on a Monday. So um, today we have a kind of a special treat, and we're, uh, as you know, we've been celebrating all the Apollo 50th anniversaries with uh, Apollo 11 in July and then Apollo 12 in November, and now we've got Apollo 13 looking at us coming up in April. Um, Dr. Tucker just happened to be in country and contacted us about a, a unique paper that he's presenting, so we thought we would go ahead and kick off the Apollo 13 celebration. Um, as you know, Apollo 13 holds kind of a special place in JSC and the Mission Control especially is hard because we had to play such a key role in getting that crew back um, alive and safe. Um, today, Dr. Basils, who is a senior lecturer for accounting within, er, at the University of South Australia Business School and associate editor of the Brit British Accounting Review, he will take a unique look at the relationship between leadership and innovative thinking during Apollo 13. Um, he discusses his findings in a study he did that he has titled, Necessity, the Mother of Invention? Question mark at the end of that. Uh, the relationship between management control and creativity. So I think we will find uh, Dr. Tucker's presentation very informative and maybe get us even some information we can use moving forward in our challenge we have of going back to the moon in 2024 and other missions that we're dealing with. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Tucker to the stage. Thanks, Tim. Um, you, you're a lot kinder than um, in your introduction than most people when I go to present. Normally I get the um, those who can do, those who can't teach, and those who can't teach consult, which is why. <laughs> but I'm moving up the food chain, um, and certainly that's the case being here at NASA to um, present this to you. I feel a bit of a fraud. I'm coming here to talk to you about NASA. Well, I'm actually here to talk about management control and using Apollo 13 as the, the vehicle, if I can use that term, to uh, illustrate what we've done in this research. It is academic research, but it's, I've tried to reduce the amount of academic sort of content because uh, like any um, research, it should be practically oriented and it should be able to be used by people. So ir irrespective of people's level or where they are in the organisation, or indeed what sort of jobs they do or are aspiring to do, this issue of creativity and control should be relevant. If it's not relevant now, it certainly will be, I'd, I'd suggest. I think um, it's any research, any presentation, any uh, paper that one writes, or even a report, or even an email that one writes, any sort of form of communication, is, is really a story. And this is the story, as I said, about the relationship between management control and creativity, and looking at the lessons that Apollo 13 could tell us. <coughs> I should explain the motivation for the research. There's always a need for, um, or a reason for doing research. There's always a, a reason for starting in the first place, and there's three for this one. Firstly, there's a personal reason. Look, there's me when I was at uh, uni, almost, sort of thing. I've changed a bit, right? Blame the Australian sun. Um, I've been a, a space nerd since about, I was about that, as long as I can remember. Um, in fact, I started my studies in, in maths and physics until it became quite clear that we didn't have a NASA in England and then Australia. And so I had to find a real job. So accounting seemed to be a good one to get. But I've, uh, I, won't, I wouldn't say that space is a passion. Um, it's more of an obsession. It's more of an addiction for me. Although I'm not in the same league as you guys who are at the literally leading edge. Secondly, it's timely, as Tim said, this is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13, April 1970. 50 years since the, um, arguably, our greatest achievement, is, is certainly in terms of the moon programs. The third motivating reason for doing this research is that it's an unresolved issue in, in research as well as in practice. The idea of control or creativity, they seem to be at loggerheads. They, they seem to be two different sides of a coin. You either have in an organisation, in any organisation, in any department, in any division, in any work unit, you either have control or you have creativity, but it's very hard to get both. So this, this uh, research is looking at, can we get both, and to what extent, and under what conditions can they work, can they coexist? 
So why Apollo 13 is the, the launch site? Um, Apollo 13, as I mean, I don't, I feel, as I said, I feel like a fraud um, talking to you about Apollo 13. But Apollo 13 was a particular mission where there was a crisis where the need for both control and creativity was quite literally a matter of life and death. Um, the events that occurred on Apollo 13 were unprecedented and re required the implementation, the development, and then the Im implementation of management control processes as well as creative solutions that would enable the recovery of the three astronauts and their safe return to Earth. Interestingly, commentaries about um, Apollo 13 have been widespread um, in engineering, in aerospace, in geophysics, project management, crisis management, disaster management, human resources. Um, but interestingly, not management uh, control. Interestingly, because the very place that is controlling the um, mission is actually called, was called management uh, uh, mission control. But yet there's been no management control commentary on Apollo 13, at least not to my knowledge, and certainly not in the management accounting literature. <coughs> I should start off with some different definitions before we kick off, really. The idea of control. Think of, I like to think of control as the systems or the processes, both formal as well as informal, that seek to bring order to organisational efforts. I like this idea of order. It's uh, for the scientific people here. It's sort of like uh, engages with and resonates this idea with this idea of entropy, where things will increase their entropy until you do something to stop it. The something you do to stop it is control, where you try to bring order to a particular system. Creativity, um, the production of novel, appropriate ideas in any realm of human activity. The key word here is production, the generation. Coming up with new ideas, whether it be in arts or education or business or everyday life. Something that's novel, something that's not been done before or certainly not been done in that context. Innovation, in contrast to um, creativity, often they're used quite synonymously, is really the successful implementation as opposed to production. So whereas creativity is the production, the generation of new ideas, innovation, the implementation of those new ideas. So those are the definitions I'm going to be working with. As uh, management, the management uh, uh, academic, the late Theodore Levitt says, um, creativity is thinking up new things, innovation is doing new things. Certainly on Apollo 13, the time lag between thinking it up and doing it was matters of hours, not much differ differentiation between creativity on the one hand and innovation on the other. So what do we know? What do we know about management control and creativity? Certainly from an academic, from a research point of view, um, we've investigated these relationships from quite a diverse range of standpoints. Um, creativity and control in team-based structures, using creativity to lead to new product introduction. Um, how middle-level managers use creativity and how dependent they are on it to enable organisational survival. The relationship between creativity and productivity. Can more creativity or less, product, uh, less, less creativity give you more productivity? And the effects of incentives on creativity. More recently, in the last 10 years, there's been also other studies which have zeroed in on this control creativity nexus, or lack thereof. Um, the challenge of demonstrating creativity and embracing formal controls. So can we have both in the same, within the same, under the same roof? <coughs> the compatibility between control and creativity. The types of controls that create the optimum conditions for creativity and so it goes on how we can rely on creativity and what ch choices of control practices we have, how we can use controls in different creative contexts. A lot of the work in uh, creativity control research has been done as you would imagine in the arts. 
certainly in the fashion industry, because there's been quite a lot of um, emphasis on control and creativity, where creativity in the fashion industry is, as you would imagine, quite central. The thing we don't know, again, even though these studies have touched on various aspects in various contexts, is, is there an inherent tension? Or to what extent is this inherent tension between creativ creativity and control really relevant? Does one of more necessarily mean less of the other? The jury's out on whether um, creativity can be supported by control. Um, however, we can, if we start looking at control and creativity not as um, either or propositions or a zero-sum game, but rather as, like light, a spectrum over which we can have different amounts of creativity, different amounts of control, then we have a different picture. We can look at a different picture of this relationship between these two things in a management situation. So we're suggesting that instead of looking at control or creativity, we can look at control as having a range of values, creativity as having a range of values. And if we do that, <coughs> we come up with... Um, this is one of the uh, animation effects that got lost. But uh, we, it doesn't need to we don't need to unfold it. We can do that by talking. On this axis here, we can look at the relative intensity of management control use. That is, are we using a small amount, using, not designing, but are we using a small amount of control, or are we using a high amount of control? Our levels of creativity can also be represented on this x-axis, on this horizontal axis, as ranging from very low to very high. So instead of being creativity or no creativity, or control or no control, we can have a range of control and a range of creativity. And portraying it this way gives rise to this two by two matrix. You can tell that I was a consultant. Um, because we have a two by two matrix, which we've developed based on the literature that I've just shown. And we've come up with four typologies of control creativity combinations. The first one, low control, low creativity, Routine, standardised tasks. Things that, yes, they may very well require a high use of control. Uh, uh, they, they may very well be important, but they don't require a high use of control because we know it very well. Things like the um, address just before, informing people to turn off the phones and what should happen in the event of an emergency and the need to exit this room. Very important, but you hear it in every presentation, no doubt. So it's largely a routine, standardised um, operation, which doesn't require a lot of creativity. Then we have this, if you like, type, control creativity type. We've called that direct, directing. Directing where we've got high amounts of control and a small amount of creativity. In other words, it's really not negotiable. Those types of activities, deci decisions, choices are not negotiable. Um, the opposite, if you like, is shown in the bottom right-hand quadrant, which we've called empowering, where we have a high amount of creativity and small amounts of control. We trust people to do the work that they're paid for. And the first thing that comes to mind here is uh, what Gene Krantz says and others have said in their book, and we'll talk about that shortly, um, the age of the flight controllers well, average age was 25 to 27. And speaking to Jerry Griffin about this, as well as um, Roger Launius, the Apollo historian at the time of um, the Apollo missions, was saying the same thing. The 25 to 27 year olds for certain parts of the mission were actually controlling the entire mission. They were, if I can be somewhat crude, the attitude was, if you've got a dog, don't bark. You don't need to bark. We rely on the expertise of the people around that um, particular table. Then we have 
And this is another area which I lost. I lost the. I, being a, a technical genius, I was just. Look, I had the latest version of the presentation setting up beforehand and deleted it. So this is the. This is what the, the previous version. The only difference is animation effects and a few comments. But one of the comments I want to ask you is that where you've got high creativity, a need for a lot of creativity because we've got unprecedented situations, and perhaps a need for control because the stakes are high and we haven't been there in that space before. We call that improvisation or improvising. The question I had for you is, is that a good um, term? Is that a good label? And when I come to trying to populate this matrix, this two by two matrix, perhaps um, you can inform me on that. I don't think the word improvising is appropriate, but uh, I'll, I'd like to be guided by you on that. So, let me talk about the research. The research was archival research, so we, we, we didn't um, interview people, we did interview people, but it wasn't the primary source of data, we didn't run surveys. We went into the um, published documentation on the Apollo 13 mission. You'd be aware of all this, the, the mission transcript, something that thick. Um, each mission had a, a transcript of the verbatim commentary between the astronauts and the mission control throughout the mission. The mission operations report, the uh, oral history transcripts of which there are hundreds um, and they're all excellent and most, most enjoyable to read, as well as the Courtright report, the report of the Apollo 13 review board, which I think Neil Armstrong was the was on. I don't think he was the, um, well, Courtright was the, the chairperson, but uh, I think Neil Armstrong was on that. We also looked at media reports and other publicly available information. All of this is public, off of the public record, by the way. We haven't hacked NASA or anything like that. Hope this is being recorded. Uh, there's two security guards. With, no. Uh, it happens to me a lot, especially in airports. The sort of thing you can expect when you look like me. Uh, but we also spoke to a number of what we call industry sources. And uh, you know, you probably know some of these people, or at least heard of them. There's Amy Shearer Titel, who's an Apollo historian. She's got her own YouTube tech channel. Um, have, you, have you come across them? Would you? Some of you might, might actually have um, spoken with her. Well worth looking at on YouTube. Isaac Arthur, who's a cosmologist, he's also got a YouTube uh, channel, mainly in cosmology, but he's also quite um, knowledgeable about the idea of um, space travel. There was um, Howard McMurdy, the professor of, um, the professor of uh, public policy at Washington, sorry, at American University in Washington. Roger Launius, as I said, who was the um, uh, Apollo historian at the time of the Apollo 7 to 17 missions. Uh, Bill Barry is the current uh, historian at NASA. <coughs> we spoke also, this, uh, this chap you may not know, he's the equivalent of your, um, I think the American term is Department of oh, Secretary of Defence. So he's the Australian Federal Minister for Defence. Um, and before that he was the Minister for Science and Technology He's now, um, he's no longer the minister. He relinquished that position at the last election about uh, 10 months ago. Christopher Pine, he's an adjunct pr professor at our university. So I interviewed Christopher about this. As well as uh, Charles Kamada uh, and another Australian, Andy Thomas, both astronauts, as you'd be aware, and Jerry Griffin, who was kind enough to pass commentary on our paper. What we did was say to these industry experts, industry sources, this is what our findings suggest, what do you think? It was, if you like, a, a litmus test, um, a, a means of triangulating or trying to confirm that we at least were on the right track. I'm pleased to say that all of them um, thought we were. So, I'll go through this in very quickly, in other presentations, I normally spend quite a long time going over the Apollo 13 flight and the events of it. I probably don't need to do that here. Um, and I've already 
from this most enjoyable tour this morning, um, learning that you guys know a lot more than what is uh, generally known about these space exploration missions. So with the original flight crew, uh, Jim Lovell, Ken Mattingly and Fred Hayes, um, the first, people think that the explosion in the aircraft was the, uh, the first problem, of course it wasn't. First problem was uh, Mattingly being replaced by Jack Swigert because of Mattingly's um, exposure to German measles. The launch at uh, 13 past one, although I have got several different um, times on that. I should have asked you about that, Tim. Um, but apparently it was 13 minutes past one on the 11th of April, 1970, 50 years ago, from the Kennedy Space Centre, Cape Canaveral. Anomaly occurred when the second stage engine shut down two minutes early, but that was uh, corrected or compensated for by four outbound engines and the third stage engine burning longer. Jim Lovell thought at the time that that was with the problems for the mission ended because apparently every mission has some sort of glitch, has some sort of problem. He thought, we've had hours. Little did he know, 55 hours, two days, just after two, just over two days into the mission, um, Jack Swigert on um, instruction from mission control, stirs the cryo tanks, there's a spark, takes out half the uh, service module, we see it here. So NASA now faced with a series of decisions. How are we going to get the astronauts back to Earth? How are we going to manage consumables, power, water, and um, fuel? And how are we going to remove carbon dioxide? Um, oxygen wasn't apparently a problem. This recycling of the oxygen was, was going to be the problem. And the need to recycle the um, carbon dioxide was going to be a major problem. So NASA are in mission control are in survival mode. First question, how do we get them back? We could do a U-turn, we can have a circumlunar abort rather than a direct abort. So a circumlunar abort strategy was de decided upon. The command module was powered down to sustain power for re-entry. The lunar module was powered up everybody moves from the command module into the lunar module. Um, the lunar module uses a lifeboat, boat, takes the um, crew with the command service module around the moon back to the Earth. The air scrubber was adapted, the square peg in the round hole, which apparently had been, was not, um, was not unprecedented. That had been apparently um, simulated according to Ken Mattingly, two years before. Um, but it had to be done very, very, very very precisely. In this instance, obviously, and it had never been done before, live. <coughs> the good news um, was that the service module was successfully jettisoned. The command module was successfully powered up, which apparently was a major problem with the condensation that had built up after it had been shut down. It became very cold condensation, hoping that there wasn't going to be another short. Luckily there wasn't. Uh, the crew transfer from the Aquarius, the lunar module, back into um, the command module, the Odyssey. The Odyssey and Aquarius successfully um, unlock. Re-entry was successful, but even then there was a problem. We're looking at six minutes for radio silence, um, rather than three and a half or four. But all was good. The mission ended safely on the 17th of April when the crew splashed down and got picked up by the Iwa Jima in the Indian Ocean. Here we, these, I like these pictures, they're a happy story. So, all very nice, all very wonderful. What does that mean? How do we marry this? How do we relate this to control and creativity? Well, let's go back to our conceptual framework. Let's go back to our model where we've got these four possible alternatives. Let's look at the first quadrant, low control, low creativity. What we've done is look, at, look through the um, NASA documentation and said, let's um, look at examples where there was low control and low creativity. And we see a few of them. Any pre-mission planning, any uh, pre-mission training, the launch pr procedures, 
In fact, the majority of activities up until the stirring of the cryotanks were routine or standardized, not because they were um, unimportant, not because they were low risk, but because they had been done before, several times before. That was the objective of Apollo, to build on the previous mission, or culminating in um, the latest mission. So we would regard those, those types of activities as routine or standardized, low control, relatively ro low control, relatively low creativity required. Our next control creativity style, coercive, this is the control creativity style where there's no negotiation, basically, where I've called that coercive. In, a, in actual fact, um, we renamed it. Is, we re renamed it as directing. So the replacement of Mattingly by Swigert was a coercive control. This wasn't something we sat down, held hands, and had a discussion. It was either you, I think, in uh, Jim Lovell's book, he. Um, he makes the point, he, it was put to him, you either take Jack or we get a new crew for Apollo 13. The management of consumables, um, how much water was needed, how much battery power was conserved, was obviously something that had been worked out, had to be worked out after the accident. And it was important to um, not really negotiate with that. And there are other um, examples, the time in the extents of the burns to remain on course. Again, this was something that was worked out by the mission controllers and radioed up to the uh, astronauts. The transfer of the crew from the command module to the lunar module, the separation and release of the service module. Ordinarily, that would be relatively routine. But uh, because of the accident and the unknown parameters of what damage had been done, it uh, became some, somewhat of a, a more risky proposition, as did the separation of the lunar module of Aquarius, as well as the procedures for course corrections. So all this was not much creativity, but a lot of control. Our third style, I've got there enabling, we, we actually um, renamed that as empowering, where a large amount of creativity was expected, tolerated, exhibited, um, and relatively less amounts of control was required. The first bullet point is something that comes up time and time again in our reading, and in just about any reading of NASA in the Apollo days, and that is the environment permitting the developments of established pre uh, procedures. Um, for early pro problem detection, for uh, processes for problem solving, for thinking outside the box, if I can use that umbrella term. The delegation of control to the flight director. A good example is the, um, I think it's Gene Krantz talks about it in his book, um, Failure is Not an Option. Um, he's discussing um, with the other flight controllers whether what should happen with the next stage of the astronauts' agenda program. <coughs> Gene is saying that um, what's important was the PTC role. The others were saying uh, power conservation was more important and sleep. I think Chris, Chris Kraft actually said sleep was more impo important. But Krantz, who was relatively uh, in the middle management in the overall hierarchy, was uh, allowed to have his views prevail, as all flight directors did. Um, I guess you can call that ra rather creative, and certainly creative for the time. The institutionalized practice of open communication, which was apparently a hallmark of NASA's operations in the 60s, 50s and 60s. And the, another example where Again, Jim Lovell talks about this in his book, where the medical team, the surgical team, who I've just seen in action in real life, um, lost all contact with the um, biomedical data that was being relayed to the, uh, the ground. And of course, the Capcom contacts the um, crew and says, 
We seem to have lost your vital signs here, Jim. And Jim Lovell said, Look, yes, I've taken them all off. I'm sick of the entire world knowing what my heartbeat is, what my blood pressure is. And I think, uh, I think it was Charlie Duke, who was the uh, Capcom at the time. He looked at Krantz, and Krantz just sort of shrugged his shoulders. And the response was, oh, OK, no problems with that, uh, uh, Jim. And of course, the other two astronauts then uh, followed suit. Um, very much enabling, very much uh, empowering. The fourth um, control creativity type, the one that I want your advice on as to whether it should be improvisation or not, where we have a high amount of control and a high amount of creativity. Both creativity and control is required. We ask the question, how can you have high control and high creativity? I'd suggest you can't have high creativity without high control. You can exercise control within a very, um, exercise creativity within a very controlled environment. A good example of that, talking to some of my colleagues from the Netherlands in this last weekend at the conference I was at, um, is the Dutch football team of the 1970s, where they played total football, which was to the world, looked as though anybody could play in any position. And in fact, that was the case. But when you've got people like Johan Cruyff and some of the other Dutch grand masters uh, playing football, you can't really tell them how to play. You have a controlling formation, you have control in terms of the rules, but you let people with talent do what they're best at, and that is exhibit that talent. Um, the premature shutdown of the second engine could be seen as a improvised or, um, as I like to think of it over the last few days, adaptive co creativity controlled so style. An environment permitting flight crews not only to develop but to adapt, to actually put into action the unforeseen difficulties, the unprecedented difficulties which um, needed to be done to end the mission safely. The circumlunar abort strategy, the use of the lunar module rather than the, the command service module, the powering up of the command module, all of these things required creativity to think through, to work through within a very, very controlled environment. So we have high degrees of creativity, high degrees of control operating simultaneously. Um, and even taking the white team offline, uh, Gene Kranz's white team, to become the tiger team, to go away and brainstorm and be creative was tightly controlled and controlled by uh, Krantz. And Krantz set, set down some very clear guidelines. Um, basically, you're not, we're not going to second guess you. Um, go for it. Try and work out solutions to these problems. We'll evaluate it in the, a subsequent um, round, if you like, of discussions. So we see each of those four quadrants populated by examples of different amounts of control, different amounts of creativity that needed to be exhibited at various parts of the mission, of the Apollo 13 mission. I think uh, I've often thought, just thinking about this paper, that Mike Tyson might be a good addition to, what well, it would have been a good addition to mission control in 1970, uh, because that... Uh, that quote here is uh, classic. It's very true, isn't it? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And Apollo 13 was punched in the face. Um, as Lovell, and Clu well, Lovell says, uh, Apollo 13 was recovered because rules were breached, because we, there was ad hoc improvisation and a climate which enabled that to occur. The question is, would that happen today? Would that happen in other organisations? Gene Krantz regards the discipline required for successful and timely implementation of those creativity-driven um, solutions, largely due to an improvised approach. And the quote is there. Um, again, the focus on never second-guessing and giving people, um, having confidence in the ability of people to do what they are paid to do which sounds patently obvious, but certainly in many organisations that, that is not the case. So what? Stephen Hawkins says what he'd like to control is people, not machines. 
Uh, machines are relatively easy to control, um, people not so. What have we done? We've looked at a unique case study, Apollo 13, to illustrate, to use as a, a lens through which we can look at this entrenched view, this conventional wisdom that creativity and control are um, polar opposites and fundamentally at odds. We think that uh, this, uh, if you like, typology, these four typologies um, in this conceptual framework, there's an academic term, um, which gives us four broad combinations represents not only the various interactions but the mutual reliance of creativity and control. They both need to work hand in hand. It's not one or the other. It's not a zero-sum game. What it is really telling us is that a variety of control and creativity relationships can and should and do function concurrently at one organization within different parts of the organization and are dynamic. They're not static. They'll change over time. So we need to be flexible. We were talking about this earlier, just before the um, uh, presentation. We hear a lot about agile organizations. Well, this is the best example of an agile um, organization I can think of, an agile example of organizational behavior, um, where different levels of control, different levels of creativity were called into play as the need arises, and that changed over, over time. Success was dependent on a, a control environment that, that permitted, that facilitated changing relationships and movement between each of the um, controls, four control styles that we've suggested. There are limitations of the study. Um, we basically have gone to the literature, we've gone to the NASA literature, but the, that literature wasn't designed to specific, specifically look at control and creativity. Um, we read that literature and what we read here is our interpretation, which is why it's important to speak to the industry sources that we did speak to. The second limitation is that the study is still exploratory and illustrative because it's, it's focused on one and only one um, scenario, one context, Apollo 13. Is this true for other organizations? Would it be true for Macy's? Would it be true for Exxon? Would it be true for the corner shop? I don't know. Oh, we can't. We have no evidence on that yet. Um, would different situations, different contexts change this four typologies that we've suggested? And as we've said, we, in order to find out, we need to obtain evidence which means further research and more studies in other organisations and perhaps in other disaster situations. I'd be very interested to apply this to the Australian bushfires or to um, the storms at Puerto Rico, which one of my um, US, um, Texas-based actually, um, colleagues suggested over the weekend. Where to from here? Um, well, we want to build on this. We've tried to unpack to an extent and contribute to the research on control and creativity. Um, but what we're, we're really doing is offering a basis for further inquiry, a model, a template to go forward. Um, it would be nice to have an empirical investigation of the people who were working at NASA at that time, which is why I got extremely excited when um, Tim told me that there might be some, likely to be some Apollo 13 events this year. Um, do feel free to call me back, I mean, because I certainly would like to be here and speak to these people myself. Um, it would help with the legitimacy, the trustworthiness and the accuracy of our findings and conclusions. From a practical point of view, it's important to remember that neither sticking to the knitting, being very controlled, being very planned, or empowering people out of hand is likely to be the answer to problems. We need a bit of both. We need to work out the conditions under which the most appropriate amount of control should be exercised and the most appropriate amount of creativity should be tolerated. Different scenarios call for different responses um, and fleshing out appropriate responses for particular scenarios would enhance the credibility of what we've suggested. That's really uh, what I wanted to talk about 
in a nutshell, it's for me, it's far more interesting and value adding to listen to you. There's Jimi Hendrix and the genre of the day. I want to do a similar thing and seek some feedback, um, but I don't want to die later, like three months later, which is what he did. Um, so, I mean, I'm happy to throw things open to questions. I'm especially interested to be guided by you as to the name of that fourth quadrant, the label that we put on it and what it should be. Um, because I think it's uh, sufficiently uh, impressive to the journal to which this paper is going to say, well, this was suggested by people at a presentation, so who am I to argue? Uh, Good morning and welcome to JSC. Thank you. So I don't know if I agree with everything that you presented this morning. And I, I say that having worked here for a number of years. I would suggest that the, the very nature of the Apollo astronauts by virtue of their military training and background, their discipline, their professionalism, they and their trainers and the mission control folks were all very systematic in the way they approached problem solving and how to uh, work through situations that were not necessarily um, normal, you know, anomalies. And I say that because I, if you look at other people that are faced with life and death kind of potential outcomes. So not the Macy's stores or not the, these I'm talking about uh, airline pilots, for example. Mm -hmm. Consistently, you will see pilots that are, they've had a, a problem on board their aircraft and they go through a step-by-step, mm -hmm. -step, I've, I've tried A, I've tried B, I've tried C. None of those things that they had practiced, rehearsed, worked out. And, or did work out with either catastrophic results or not. The same with the Apollo crews. They simulated many of these. I thought you had a good point about Mattingly saying they actually tried the dissimilar box, uh, the lithium hydroxide box, the canisters, you know, odd shapes to make sure they would work two years before. Yeah. I didn't know that, but. It's in the oral history. Yeah. And, so it's, you know, it's a, and we've actually direct, posted it directly in our paper. So, so yeah. it's good. So, I mean, you, you use the word creativity. Yes, I look at Jim Lovell's book when he, he was talking about that incident where he created this little map light for he's flying a fighter off of the carrier. Mm -hmm. And he plugs his map light into the jet power jack. And it knocks out every mm -hmm. single power system mm -hmm. on his aircraft at night out over the ocean. And he's, and he's, got, he's got a compass. <laughs> And that's about it. He's got to somehow find his way back to the aircraft carrier. And all the, and he's flying around, he's circling around, or whatever. And he notices a phosphorescent wake mm. that he realized was churned up by the aircraft carrier mm. um, in the propellers. So he says, aha. And he doesn't panic. He doesn't say, oh, what? he's at night. He's got no power on his airplane. He doesn't know where the carrier is. I mean, he's lost but he doesn't panic by his, dis his military discipline and, and he follows that wake back to the carrier and he lands success. And NASA then chose him as an astronaut and chose him as a commander for Apollo 13. These people were selected for their discipline and so I'm not asking you a question per se, but I'm just make, trying to make a point. And all these people in this room and everybody here at JSC, all 10,000 of us, we're all focused on that, making, ensuring the crew's safety, supporting the mission that's been assigned for us for human space flight. We're all part of that mm. organization, all dedicated to that. And that whole organization comes, and we all come from dissimilar backgrounds. That's another key point. Max Faget came off of submarines. NASA as an entity was created out of nothing in 1958, and they pulled together all these different disciplines and that kind of synergy, that kind of magic, 
and that discipline and that hard work all led to these successful Apollo moon landings. Everybody contributing to that. Everybody, all of us in our own small way, all contributing all the way up. That's an important part of our culture here mm. at JSC, and mm. I hope you get a chance to, uh, to meet some of the people here, and I, I think you'll find similar sentiments. As, as uh, Jean Kranz says, the, the culture being one of needing to work the problem and creating um, an environment where people with the right stuff are employed. Everything you've said is, is, is been borne out. In fact, one of my co-authors is particularly um, hot on the fact that everything was procedure driven and it needed to be procedure driven. Um, the question is, is there in such an, a, a, situ a situation scenario, is there room for creativity then? Is that what we're saying? There's no room for creativity. No, I'm not saying that. Certainly they would have an openness. Yeah. To, and there was a lot of trust. Yeah. I mean, if somebody said, try this, okay, they just, mm. they just did it. Mm. They might not understand the subtleties or the ramifications, but they, they trusted their colleagues to say, okay, do this. Mm. You know, you could throw that switch. Mm. Mm. So we'll simulate this. Well, they did simulate everything. Yeah. minimum amount of power required that mm. they could maintain control of the spacecraft and keep, keep guidance, you know, and, and then yet come back up again um, when they came back to Earth, did the burn, and came back and that stuff. Mm. So you have excellent sources, and you're in the right place. So, <laughs> so I, I can't believe I'm here, I mean, this is... <laughs> but point well, points well taken. And, and, and I must make the paper, I will make the paper available to you. I'm expecting it to be, it's under rev, re, revise and resubmit, re, un, under revision at the moment. I've completed the revisions. Um, they will go in at the end of January. Should get some word end of February. Academia is a very, very slow moving um, beast. It, the, I would imagine there'll be yet another revision because there always is um, by mid year. It should be ready, but I will, I will make it make def definitely make it available, and these slides are, will be made available. Well, certainly made available to you. And I invite uh, I invite anybody if they want to discuss or ask anything or make any comment to um, to contact me directly, email me. I'd be very happy to, your to do point that. About what if? Yeah. That is creativity there for us. What if this happens? Well, what do we do? How do we yeah. respond? How do we, there, there comes your. Yeah, the, the environment which en enables the production of those ideas and then allows people to put it into action. I mean, that, that, that's massively creative. Um, and with all due respect, I'm not trying to be derogatory. You could turn around and say, well, NASA is a government organisation and certainly in Australia, government organisations are seen to be staid, conservative, risk averse and not using creativity at all. This is the best example of it I've ever seen. Let me just get it and get some feel. I must do this. Um, that third quadrant, that fourth quadrant, improvisation, is that the right word? Has anybody got anything like, is anybody, is anybody sort of like thinking, well, he should be calling it something else? Please. Okay, we've got one over here as well. But just to mention, if, if I get you to go back to the quadrants, if that's not too troublesome. No, no, it's not. Uh, what happened to me when I first saw your chart is that my immediate reaction was that I think you have it flipped about the horizontal axis. Uh, if you take a look at the way you have it set up, when you're talking about high creativity versus high control, and coming from a military background, you know, you're in situations where you kind of see these things occasionally. But you had, I believe it was standardization in the bottom left, where it was low control, low creativity. Correct. And to the point, if you can find control as, you know, hands off, you know, that, that might make sense. But to me, standardization is the ultimate of high control. If I can make you a procedure and tell you to do this every time mm -hmm. and then force you to do it, yep. that's me exerting the most control possible. The Absolutely. fact that that little chime goes off before every presentation is them inserting control. Now, they're not enforcing it, so maybe that is low control. But if you're able to enforce it, then it becomes high control. So say you put standardization in the top left. 
what if you look at the bottom right? You'd said that one was empowering. That was low control, high creativity. Is that really empowering, though? That, that to me, in the unideal situation, that's chaos. That's improvising. That's winging it. Mm. That's me being able to take a project and just do whatever I want. Mm. Uh, management that is involved in what their engineers are doing, or their scientists, or anyone, saying, look, we want you to do the best you can. Here's what we're doing to let you do that. They're exerting control in a way, because they're implementing these strategies to make it happening. So yeah. to me, I would put empowering in the top right. I would put improvisation in the bottom right. And I would go about it that way. But again, maybe I'm thinking from the ideal scenarios rather than you know, the dangerous side. Because I think the trap to the thinking is that only employees can be creative or only management can have control. And that's certainly not true. Mm. And I say that because what well, then would go in your bottom left corner? I would say that'd be something more akin to tribal knowledge. Uh, people doing things because we've always done it this way. But mm. they don't take the time to impart that knowledge as to the why we do it this way. That's them taking hands off of control and at the same time expecting people to try and be creative enough, but not too much. Mm. Because if you get too creative, now you've went off the rails and we've lost it. So that's just kind of my idea about it. If you flip it over, I think it just makes so much more sense to me. But maybe that comes from a different background. Um, it's interesting because in, at the conference, somebody said something similar. And the res our response is that this is a problem, us not explaining. Because what, I agree with what you said. But there's a difference between, and even in the management control, academic literature, the research, differentiates between the design of control and the use of it. What you're saying is, is correct if you look at control in terms of design. It is designed to be this way. We're looking at the pragmatic use of it. And that's something we need to obviously talk about and clarify in the paper, and we will. In fact, I have. Um, but certainly in the presentations. Very good point. Did you have any ideas about whether that, that quadrant should be improvisation then, or? I, I agree with the flipping empowerment and improvisation. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. I like, I like the idea. I mean, empowerment is seen as almost, uh, almost communism, socialism, but somebody makes a decision to do that, which in itself is coercive, which in itself is high control. Uh, it's, it's very important then to clarify these things. Yeah. Because if you talk to someone who says, well, I want high control and high creativity, he'll tell you, we'll call it fantasy. Yeah. And I guess what we're, we're, we're advocating a contingency approach. There's no silver bullet, and it's, it, by putting it on the table, by saying that there are different combinations, it goes a long way towards um, solving it, if I can be crude. There's a fellow in the middle here who, yes? Yeah, it might be cheating because they use the word creativity in it, but instead of improvisation, I think that's top right box to be, like it's like focused creativity, because it's still, you're allowing So would that word be focused then? I think you have to bring in the self-disciplined aspect of the top quadrant, top right quadrant. Because if you're, what we described here with Jim Lovell, uh, he was self-disciplined in that cockpit, working through his checklists. He knew what was going to work. He was an expert. But then he was allowed to be creative. So I think it's like self-disciplined creativity in the upper quadrant. You still have all the constraints, but you don't need the Yes, I like to evaluate this and, uh, discredit the solution without having the, the overarching control. Whatever we call it, I'm going to incorporate that in our paper. It's a very good point.
to set limits on which quadrant would predominate or prevail. I could see, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see more research tailored to this sort of framework and saying, look, let's test it. To, 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 I did, well, to get to the bottom of exactly what you've put up there. Because we don't know, there's no evidence. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Feedback from the audience, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, we're, we're aiming towards.